people coming in. Hello. Hello. Um, it's nice Hello. to see you. It's fantastic to see you all. Um, I'm Scarlett. I'm an Amsterdam-based teacher. I'm a cellist. And uh, I really like it, Rick, that this is our, I think, our fifth or our fourth Zoom conversation. Fourth? Fantastic. Oh. And um, we are together with cellists, amateurs and teachers, which is marvelous, from the United States all the way to New Zealand. So um, thank you for being here. And um, the word is to you. All right. All right. Welcome. Thank you so much. It's good to be Thank you, Scarlett, for making this happen, because this is something that if it was up to me, it'd probably never occur. So Scarlett's the one that set the system up and, and put it out there for people to know about. And I do appreciate all your efforts that way. Um, it is so great to see you all. I know we all have our various um, love-hate relationship with Zoom. But one of the very nice things about Zoom is this business of people can attend from anywhere. And when we provided a virtual uh, summer cello institute, National Cello Institute and a virtual winter workshop sponsored by the National Cello Institute, we had teachers from the United States and Canada and Belgium and Japan and Australia and New Zealand, and they all were able to show up and observe and watch. And that's one of the greatest things. And we had students, by the way, from all over the United States as well, um, who, who didn't have to get on an airplane and come to California, you know? So it was just great. Um, um, so what I'd like, what we're gonna do today is I hope that you will, um, I see you, I see people with cellos, I would like you to do these activities with me. I'll need you to put yourself on mute uh, so that so that we don't hear it. It's it, you know with again with Zoom the synchronization is weird. Um, I am anxious to answer any of your questions. So either I'm going to ask Scarlett to keep track of the chat. I'm not going to keep try to keep track of chat. If you want to put a question on chat, Scarlett will let me know. If you want to wave your hand and un unmute yourself to ask a question, that will be fine too. We'll try and monitor that. Uh, if you have a question that you can hold until the end, uh, we'll try to have uh, some time at the end where, where we can all discuss, all right? But I do, uh, my, my, one of the nice things about this particular one is that we'll be interactive and we'll be playing together. In the other ones, I was explaining my books. And so that's great, but this one will be much more uh, inclusive in that. Um, one of the things that I'm enjoying about these sessions is, is, is I was telling Scarlett, um, the things that I'm, I'm trying to share are not about repertoire. We all have repertoire that we use. So whether you use the Suzuki system or something else, we all have repertoire. And we know the repertoire. We know the way we teach it. And, you know, and that's fine. But what we're talking about is we're going to talk about kinds of things that you do to prepare the students to be successful at the repertoire that you want to give them. The, the, what I, I, I actually told this to a well, a teenager kind of student who was a transfer student to me from another teacher and was not used to my system. And I, I explained to her that, you know, it may, every teacher may not do this, but this is, my approach is this. I do not give a student a piece to play until I'm sure they knew how to do everything in that piece successfully. Knowing that they can do all the technical things successfully in that piece, then we can start and learn the notes and the bowings and whatever, and that should not be a terrible issue. And we can get off into making music. Um, um, so, so all of these things we're talking about are stuff that happens before, so that when they get to the repertoire, um, um, uh, they, they are successful. Uh, here's one example. I was, I was asked several years ago now to teach in Hawaii a teacher training course 
And the teachers had a whole bunch of questions that they wanted to deal with, like how do you teach Bach to children? And uh, how do you teach vibrato, right? And these kinds of issues. And as I grappled with how I was gonna present this, my mind went to a book, which actually I've never read, but it was a book that a few years ago is pretty famous in the United States. That book is called, Everything I Know I Learned in Kindergarten. And so I adopted that because my lecture became everything I know I learned in book one. And my idea is that I can teach the kids stuff in book one with my vision of where they need to be in book 10 and, and prepare them for that. So, so I, and I say that sometimes to teachers and maybe even to students, so I haven't used it recently. When I'm teaching in book one, I'm really teaching book 10. Now, I don't know if everybody here does the Suzuki system and that doesn't matter to me in the least, uh, but just in terms of my terminology, uh, book 10 is the end of the Suzuki repertoire sequence and it is the Baccarini Concerto. Book nine is hide and see, book 10 is Baccarini. Beyond that, you know, the, the, it's wide open. It can be Sansal, it can be Elgar, it can be any number of things. Hungarian Rhapsody, it can be Clonidre. It just doesn't matter once you get out there. But in terms of my terminology, that's why, that's what book 10 is. Book 10 is like the culmination of the Suzuki sequence of repertoire. Okay, so. What do we do? What can we do at the beginning in preparation for book 10? And that's why this is called, this talk is called book 10 plus two, book 10 preparation, right? Now, uh, here's, you can, you can get your cellos out if you wish. Um, here, uh, I need to present one more thing before of talking, before we actually do stuff. Uh, maybe two things. One, I did go back and and listen to the the, the discussions of that I gave of uh, position pieces book one and book two, and some of the things that I mentioned there are going to happen again here, right? So so it wouldn't be bad for you to be sure to see those. My goal is to keep this less less long. Those were all an hour and a half long, and I don't want this to be that long. So I'm going to try to move on through it. But, um, but you'll, you'll see, you'll hear a couple of things more than once if you go back and check that. But here's one of the things. Teachers, we cannot explain with words how something feels. So stop trying, okay? You know, I get this why I'm old. And I say stuff like this, you know, just don't even try to explain how something feels because you can't. What you need to do is give the children an activity to do, which will allow them to acquire the feeling for themselves, something they actually do. And then you take, you take, I, I like to give what I call trigger words to them. I give them a label. But then if forever after, if I'm saying bird wings or something, it's what it means. And it's associated with an actual feeling and an actual experience that they've had in their own body. That, that means I don't have to spend too much time trying to talk. And I did mention in the position thesis book one, how when, when we in the SAA have asked teachers to record themselves giving a lesson and then watch it, almost all of them say, well, I talk too much. And so our goal is to give them stuff to do and not try to talk about things that are inexplicable, all right? So um, here's one of them. It's called, uh, and I'm gonna to try to give credit along the way where credit is due. A lot of the stuff I learned from Margaret Raleigh um, and, and she used what she calls the bear hug, okay? Now, this is something you guys can do with me. For your information, for your information, 
When Margaret did the bear hug, she went all the way to the sides of the cello like this. And she was very much into how you use your weight to create what she called suction in your fingers, the weight. And she would stand up and move around with the cello like this um, as her example for the feeling. This has come into some controversy since then though, because it causes the shoulders to stick up. Now you can feel that yourself, I'm sure. So nowadays, the way, at least the way I do it, the bear hug is here on the fingerboard, okay? You plop your hands down on the fingerboard. You can still feel that suction. You can pull to the side and feel the contact your fingers have with the fingerboard, but it does not cause the shoulders to stick up, okay? Um, in general, this is it. The power comes from your back, from your big muscles. This is not obvious when you watch a person play the instrument, but it's true. And I used to be surprised at this, but many years ago, you know, I was trying to teach a student how to make tone from their back. The mom was a piano teacher and said, that's exactly how I teach piano. And at first it just had never occurred to me, but it's true, it's true. This is the power to make the sound and it's not tension produced, it's with weight and with balance, okay? So this is one of the first feelings that we wanna have, the feeling of using our weight. I asked the students to move like this and feel their shoulder blades moving, okay? And try to go just, I use this word a lot, plop. I hope that word makes sense to people who not have English as their first language, just plop. And the idea is complete relaxation, but with balance of weight. Then this motion here, this one's called bird wings. So I will label this. This is the bear hug. This is bird wings. I read uh, many years ago now, I read a book by Claude Kennison called The New Approach for Cellists. Uh, he was taking Kato Havash uh, teaching violin and applying it to the cello. And there were a couple of things from that book that I remember to this day. One of the things he said was, if you suspect something is tight, make it move, okay? Because you cannot be tight and move. So if you're doing motion games and you're doing this wiggle and you're not allowing them to do this with the, what I call chicken wings, okay? If you're doing the big eagle wings or whatever word you wanna use, where you're involved in your back, well, here's the feeling that we need, okay? Now, the things that I am going to, to show you, I'm trying going to try to show you a lot of activities. Um, I'm going to try to show them to you in a logical sequence, though you can mix them up and use them anytime and that's appropriate. I'm, I, I do not do all of these activities all at the same time. I did not do all of these things in a row, but I wanted to give you a whole collection of things that you can bring out and use as necessary and as appropriate with your teaching. And I will refer to this, so I won't talk about it a lot now, but one of the things that happens is, uh, this is so great in group class. If you guys keep, teach group classes, it's really, really good. And I would have in, in my semester, in the school semester, I would have a particular thing that we would do the entire semester. And then the next semester we could move along and do something else. All right, so here's one of the first things is what Margaret Rowell used to call knuckle knocks. And it's where your hand is very, very soft and very, very wiggly. And you move from here to here to here to here. Now, you will notice one thing instantly, I hope, is that there's book 10 posture. Thank you very much, right? You got to play the Bacchini Concerto here. And here it is. And one of the huge mistakes that happens in book one is kids learn to play like this. Their bow rolls to the A string. The left arm comes back. And while you might survive book one like this, you're surely not going to go very far beyond book one with this posture. And I explain it to my students. So fine, why should we learn book one posture and have it change it later? 
well, let's learn book 10 posture now and use it forever, you know? And so this is one of those first examples of how you set the shoulder square, bring the elbow a little bit forward, and this nice little pivoting action in your arm gets you all over the entire table. Now, I, I was not taught this when I was young. One of the things that, that happened is I got really poor teaching when I was young. And I do tell people that if I, if I am considered to be a good teacher, one of the reasons it's true is because I had such poor training and I had to fix it all later. And by fixing it, I was able to incorporate what's going on. And I remember, I thought my arm was fine, but I was not doing well up here. And it wasn't until I got pulled to bring the forward, that suddenly it solved it. And suddenly this pivot, take a look, it covers the entire thing aboard. That was not something I knew before. So this one is a good one. You can do knuckle locks with both hands. And again, the point of this is it's not a piece. It's not something you today. It's not something you spend hours in or doing. But it is a thing that allows the students to feel the feeling of the proper balance and the proper flexibility and range of motion. Next, what I would call ski jumps. And for this, you know, here again, I call this the blob. Now I had, I hope that works for you guys. I had real trouble in Brazil, uh, South America when I was there because the blob didn't translate, okay? But the blob is like jello, you know? It's wiggly and it holds a shape, but it's soft and wiggly, okay? So this is the blob. And I put my blob between the D and the A strings on the fingerboard, and I slide off the end of the ski jump, off the end of the ski jump. Now, I don't want the kids to pull back this way. You're going to get a little pluck. You're going to get a little sound when you jump off the end of the ski jump, but that should not come from a sideways motion. So one institute, a friend and I were both teaching this concept, we put little smiley faces in the palm of their hand. And the goal was when we were sitting opposite them in the group class, we want to see the smile, okay? You want to see the smile. And you'll do this with your right hand as well. And when you put your blob between the D and the G string here and you jump off the ski jump, you'll hear a G pluck. All right, so here's a D that you will hear when you jump off the fingerboard, and here's a G that you will hear. Now, this actually got presented in book one of uh, my presentation of book one of uh, physician pieces, but it's worth mentioning again. In a group class or by yourself, you, you as teachers, they as students, but in a group class, some of the people can play a tune. They can play long, long ago in book one, the key of G. And the little kids who maybe don't even know how to play a song yet, they can do this. And it goes like, you start with your bow hand. This is one, yeah, you have to, it's nice to have, if you've got a bunch of little kids in your group class, it's nice to have a leader that they can watch. Bow hand. And we'll hear the G when we pluck the ski jump on the bow hand. G. Oh, a cello hand. Bow hand here, cello hand here. Oops, I'm wrong. Bow hand here. Da da da. Bow hand, right hand. Da. That's it. That's it. That's it. That's it. And now D on the cello hand. Da. 
and Bohan Dadaline. Okay? Both hands. And, you, and I've said this I'm, in the other presentation, so I'm going to say it only once. Even though the, as you watch a person play, it seems like the function of the two hands is quite different. At the core, that it's the same. The weight comes from the back, and we balance it on the instrument, provides us with the power to play. And if we have the weight balanced and the motion flexible, it works with both hands. So doing this with both hands makes sense. I had another thought passing through my mind and I can't think of it right now. Okay, so there is another thing that I like to do that can incorporate uh, the littlest kids in your group, okay? One of the things that I do, uh, that I've done, and I've got some things from Cello Institute publications where I've tried to create music where the littlest kids can play along with the biggest kids and they've all got a part that's appropriate to their level. Um, one of the things that the little kids can do is play harmonics, okay? So back, way back into the position, again, I'm not gonna repeat everything I said then. In Position Pieces Book One discussion, I made a big pitch about getting rid of the marks on the fingerboard. Do it at the beginning, do it at the beginning. It's useful at the beginning, but get rid of them quick. All right, and I do keep this mark on the harmonic, however, I keep this mark. And the reason is I'm gonna want the kids to play this harmonic. Uh, first of all, they can see it. One of the reasons not to look at your left hand in book one is because it twists your body, okay? So that's one of the reasons not to look. Here, you can look, doesn't twist your shoulders. The exercises I want to give the kids, the activities I want to give them, are about how does it feel, and I don't want to complicate it with how do you find the spot. So we're going to mark the spot, and that makes it really easy. And and the way I do it is I do it with my blob thumb hand, my blob hand with my thumb in this way. So we will plop, 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 and we'll plop our hand on this spot with our thumb resting lightly on the harmonic place on the D and the A string. This does take a little bit of preparation with the kids. They'll do 20 things, they'll stick out their hands. No, just use the blob, blob, blob. There it is. It doesn't take them too long to get this. I do it with the thumb always. The reason is a person can play harmonics with third finger and be in a terrible position back. And this whole, whole point is to give them uh, the, the thing, uh, to give them the proper feeling. And using the thumb up here ensures that. And that's, this is the thing that I forgot I was gonna say during the long, long ago discussion. And this will permeate everything I give you. Number one, I want to give the students things that when they're doing it, it's correct, right? You create an activity so that even if they're doing it, we know it's wrong. The point being, they've got to get home and do it properly without your supervision, right? So you need to give them something that you're sure they know how to do correctly. And then you want to give them lots of opportunity to repeat it correctly. And that's why running through the whole long, long ago song is a good thing because they get a lot of repetition in that. And yet it's a tune and it's fun and it works. It's an ensemble, if you will. So the same is going to be with some of these harmonic issues. I want to do this plop with the, with, the, with the knuckle knocks first and then plop down on the harmonic press. One of the first things I'll do, we'll need to go for this, is this one. I'll just have them plop on the D and the G string and play a D and G harmonic. Back and forth with the knuckle locks. I, I used to, when we were in a group, I would go one, two, three, four, plop. Your turn. Bum, bum, my turn. Your turn. Bum, bum, my right. One, two, as long as, as many times as you find it necessary, plop, my turn. Your turn. Boom, boom. Now, what we can do is with the bigger kids or you as teacher can play Rigadoon. 
And the little kids will play this on all the dotted half notes, okay? I call this a cuckoo. Sounds like a cuckoo bird, kinda. And so to give it a name, I just call it the cuckoo. And so the little kids are gonna sit here and they're gonna have their 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 posture and their knuckle knocks and they're going to be all balanced here and we're going to do cuckoo are you ready g ya la 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 this two lines, there are no dotted half notes, so this is all about bird wings while they hold their plates. La 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 So here again, it's an activity where the little kids are set up. Their hand is soft. We're not, if, let me just say this now because it's occurring to me. It permeates almost everything we're going to do here today. You want to teach vibrato? Teach them not to squeeze with their thumb. Because the bad vibratos all come from this, all come from squeezing and shaking. If you teach the kids how to play without squeezing with their thumb, then when it comes to the proper time, vibrato is going to work. And so again, we're going to start that in book one. This is not something that you want to deal with and fix later. One of the hardest things that, that, that we do is fix a vibrato that's bad. And I won't talk about that. It's going to take too much time off the main course of our discussion. But you've had enough experience. You know that if you got a student with a bad vibrato, you basically have to start over again and retrain it. So let's just avoid that whole issue by teaching the kids at the beginning how to play without squeezing with their thumb. Now, jumping a little bit, I'm gonna take this one through a sequence that is not appropriate for the littlest kids. The littlest kids can still sit there and play the cuckoos, but your big kids can start doing this. <laughs> cool things about this, and you're going to see this again throughout everything we talk about today, every time I get them to release their thumb and move is a good thing. Because it gets their thumb loose, their hands off. Then we can take what I call, and I'm going to let you guys play this. I'll show it to you the first two lines, and then we'll try it. This is hard. This is a super bonus challenger round. This one's a little bit challenging. When we get there. So you see cuckoo on every dotted half note and just a harmonic D on every regular half note. So we're gonna, let's just try it. Do the best you can. This is a little hard to catch the very first time through, but that's where the recording is gonna help us. You can all go back and refer. So let's give this a try. Let's try the super challenge bonus round of Rigadoon and the harmonics. Ready, go. <laughs> Thank you. 
This really is a challenge. Uh, Celia is asking, is this meeting meant for cello teachers or for beginners who are learning to play the cello themselves? I belong to the last group, but wonder if I if I is also if it is also meant for pupils. Can you answer that? Uh, yes. My basic uh, approach is basically to teachers as they're presenting these issues to their students. But there's nothing wrong with a student hearing these things and trying these things out. Because ultimately you hear it from me or you hear it from your teacher, one way or the other. And you may find if you're not experienced with some of these things, you may find them a little hard. Um, um, and in which case that's fine. You know, there's nothing wrong with that. And again, I say to you all, that's where, where, where Scarlett and making the recording and making the recordings available is so valuable. Because even if you don't quite get it here today, you can go back and listen and you can check it out for the future. So, so yes, if you are a team of students and you're tuning into this, just please try it anyway. And, and don't worry about it if it doesn't work the first time through. Okay? Um, there's one more thing that I want to show you. Uh, that 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 it deals that the little kids can do with just harmonics alone, and then there's a few more things that will come up. I want to give credit to this next thing to Rodney Farrar. He figured this out. He's got a book. I think it used to be on lane, online called Fat Notes, and and he's got a, a Go Tell Aunt Rody ensemble which uses harmonics as a desk camp. Uh, Rigadoon, Cuckoos, I'll game, take credit for that one myself. Uh, but, but Rodney Farrar did this. You can teach this in a group. My turn, listen. G string. When we do this in a group, I usually say to the kids, what's your favorite color? Kid says red. Okay, here's the red part. Let us all play the red part. Ready? Go. And I'm going to kind of run through this. You have to do it many times with the kids till they get it. But it's not that hard. You get it done in 15 minutes. You get it. Red part two times. Next one, what's your favorite color? You know, we get red, blue, and some kids said gold. Fine, here's the gold part. Listen to the gold part. It's the same as the red part, only we're playing G instead. Okay, so let's play the gold part and let's play it twice. Ready? Go. twice, gold part twice, red part twice. Ready? La, 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 la.
Sorry, I seem to see, while I was singing the song, I got some of the rhythms wrong. So don't copy my rhythms on that, copy my rhythms from when I introduced them for the first time. Um, but you see how this works. Again, the littlest kids can do this up here in this posture. All kinds of stuff gets said about teaching beginners, how bad this is. So people say, you know, we should really begin in thumb position. Well, all right, except you don't want to try to teach them whatever your student level is. You don't want to teach a beginner kid. I've got students from age five up until age whatever, you know, you don't want to try and teach them the thumb position notes. They say you should start on the C string. Well, they're right. But on little teeny cellos, if I'm teaching on an eight size cello, the T string often sounds really bad. And if we're looking for tone, it's not really, really helpful to play on the, the low strings. Um, I've got some to show you, which we'll do in group class. But the point being that this puts it in this place and all we're doing is playing harmonics. And it's and it and it's it holds the spot. It's loose because you're not trying to find a note. You're not trying to press the swing down to create a pitch on the fingerboard, and and you're holding it in the correct posture through the whole thing. All right, moving quickly now. Um, when you when it comes time to start actually making the fingers sink into the string to create an actual pitch. Okay, there's, I love this business of playing harmonics and non-specific notes up here where it doesn't matter. But when we actually are starting to create uh, the idea that we need to stop the string completely to get a solid sound, and you want to do that without squeezing with the thumb, you need to do that with your weight from your back. First of all, blah, blah, blah. Flop and then sink. But here, I want you to meet Gary. Gary is an alligator. Gary is a silly name. Uh, I showed this to my teachers in Austin with the Suzuki Institute. They liked it so much they needed to give him a name. And his name is now Gary. Gary is a very floppy, very soft toy and very, very squishy. Okay, really squishy. And you put Gary here, you put your fingers there, and you sink. And your fingers sink down into Gary. It sinks down in. I'm not, I don't let my students do this, but I show them this. When I do this, I'm not using my thumb at all. I'm putting my arm forward and up. I'm thinking about my weight, my back, and sinking. And so here again, this is not the kind of thing that you're gonna do for weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks. But if you're trying to introduce a feeling to a student without using too many words, here it is. You put your blob on Gary and then you sing, okay? Now, I wish I knew how to tell you where to get these. Um, we got them at a store here in, in, in LA. Uh, they've gotta be somewhere online. And I think the most important thing to see is how wiggly it is, how squishy it is. It needs to be, if you're gonna try to find one of these and be very, very soft, okay? So here we go with this idea. Now, so that means we might do something like this. Now I'm jumping around a little bit here. This is not something I would teach my twinkle students, but this is something that my students can do in book one. Carrie Hockett, who also has a great set of resources online. I think her website is called Corky Bird. Corky Bird. So you can look up Corky Bird or Carrie Hockett. She's got music and all kinds of stuff here. She's a terribly wonderful creative person. She wrote this piece called Countdown. Um, let me show you the end product. I'm not going to do the end product with you very much. Uh, the end product and the reason it's called countdown is it started out as a shifting piece where it went four, three, two, one. Four, three, two, one. And that's a great exercise for this. But I have some pre previous versions that I do 
which do not involve shifting so much. The first one I call the blob version. And it's just without shifting. It's now I'm overdoing the size of the motion in my arm right now. I'm overdoing that because I'm trying to at least give the students a hint of how it might feel to use your weight and to sink and not do this factory with your fingers and squeeze. Okay. So countdown, if you can just follow me, it's only those two lines and I like to do the repeat just for the repetition business. It starts on an up bow, it starts on open D and here we go. And repeat. And, and it's so nice to use. I mean, the shifting is the reason it was written and it's perfect for that purpose, but you know, it's perfect for this purpose as well. So then what I'd like to do is I like to do the harmonics version with a blob here, G, then harmonic. G, then harmonic. D, and harmonic. And we'll repeat. G and harmonic. Harmonic. So you see here again, anytime I get them to release their thumb and move their arm. Rick, do you by any chance have got sheet music of this? Say that again, please. Have you got by any chance sheet music of this? Uh, I think Carrie Hockett probably has countdown on her website. If not, I might, yes. Super. Um, I have written out the harmonics version of Talent Rody. I might have this as well, but I don't remember. Uh, if you send me an email, I'll, I'll search for it, okay? If it's there, it's on my computer somewhere because I put it all into now. And so, and so, uh, if so, I would be happy to send it forward to you. But do look at Carrie Hockett's site because she's the co original composer in the first place. Um, Elizabeth says, Carrie Beth Hockett has shared it on the Suzuki Cello Teachers Facebook page. I'm not in that. But okay. thank you, Elizabeth, for telling us. Yes, yes. And as I said, credit where credit is due. We borrow from each other, we share. And it's really one of the rich things about the Suzuki system is the teachers are so open and willing to exchange ideas. You know, back in the old days, someone said, would say to a teacher, well, how do you get your students to play so well? And the teacher said, well, come and pay me for lessons and I'll show you. And we don't have that attitude. The attitude is let's share it. We've all figured stuff out that works and let's just, let's just all use it, you know? And everybody benefits from that. And Carrie is awfully good at that. So, so do look up her website. And, and again, I don't think you have to go to the Suzuki website to see her. I do believe she's got her own website. So, so try and check that out. And again, if you have trouble with that, someone should let me know. I'll find it and send you the link, okay? So I can help you. All right, so let's just do one other thing that deals with this business of large motions with the little kids moving freely all over the fingerboard, okay? And this I will call water slides. These were ski jumps. And then this is water slides where we're gonna plop our hand, we're gonna one, two, three, and plop. And we're going to tuck our fourth finger next to the A string, and we're going to take the water slide down to a D. Okay. 
And then we're going to go plop, 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 and tuck our finger down into the D string and slide down the slide to a G. And so this is allegro, is what this is. This part, there's no slides, so again, bird wings. La 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 la. Something happened. Can you hear me now? Okay, then. And again, the bigger gig is actually play a song, right? And get the same experience, but play all the rest of the notes also. Um, so, so here again, we're talking about, we're talking about large motions, freeing up the body. Oh, come on. That's my text message. Sorry, folks. Um, freeing the body up, having a balance, getting the shoulders right, getting the elbows right, being able to get all over the instrument with ease playing with balance and not with tension. And if we can do this in book one, I mean, you can see all of this, right? You get out there into the future and stuff's gonna work. If, you're if, the if you allow the kids to squeeze and do bad things in book one, you gotta fix it. And so let's not go there. Why bother trying to fix it when you can do this in book one? Okay, now I was keeping this out because I am 10 minutes from the end of my session here. Actually five if we have time for questions. So let me talk to you very quickly about one other category of things that I like to do to help, to help the kids arrive at the feeling of a proper posture. And I mentioned it once, this business of playing on the low strings. So maybe I won't ask you to play all the way through this stuff with me just for to save time. Uh, but I tell people, here's one of my favorite songs. It's called Go Tell Aunt Rhoda. And so on. We would play the whole thing. Like I said, I'm trying to save time right now. And I have another song I like very much. It's called Go Tell Uncle Rhodey. And the kids get a little giggle out of that. And then I tell them, and I got another one I like really well. It's called Go Tell Grandpa Rody. And of course, by now they're laughing because they get it. And in this way, take a song they already know bring them around to the lowest string, which brings their elbow forward and their bow arm down. And you've got your posture, your book 10 posture. One thing I was going to say, and I did not say it, I'm not talking a lot about the bow today, mostly about the body and the ease with the left hand. There's a lot to talk about with the bow, not the least of which when you start teaching your kids the bow, you want to use one of these twinkle bows, okay? That means that they can hold the bow properly and there's no weight to support. So we, um, Scarlin and I have discussed that we have 
we have three more sessions we want to do. I, I want to talk to you about one finger scales. We've set up, we've set up a date, October 12th. It's another Tuesday. It would be at the same time. And the point of this will be a one finger scale discussion. And, and, and uh, again, by breaking it out, it would mean so we wouldn't have to spend a long, long, long time discussing it. Then we want to talk about position, no, thumb position book one, thumb position book two. And again, I say to you, by breaking them into those sessions, the one of the things that I'm just sorry about in my previous um, um, just, um, recordings with this thing is that they're all an hour and a half long. And that's a huge commitment of time to make people try and do that. So this will break it down into chunks that will be more manageable to look at. And what I'm gonna say now is, if you wanna talk about bow and bow strokes, I got one of those too. I tend to think that in book one, we teach four bow strokes. We teach legato, staccato, marchale, and detache. And if you can teach those four bow strokes in book one, they branch and refine into all advanced bow strokes into the future. So there is a discussion. If you're interested, let's scarlet note. And we'll try and 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 schedule that one. Um, I'm I'm not going to talk about repertoire, but I do think some of these issues apply to any repertoire. Um, let me say one final thing. I did say it in position pieces book one. When your students can find fourth position, elephant twinkle is a really really good exercise. <laughs> fourth position but it is somewhat the embodiment of everything I've tried to show you today if they're even playing these notes here they're in the right position and that means that when they get home they'll be practicing it correctly so that's one of the one of the underlying issues behind all of these things I've tried to show you today is to allow the students to have things that are technically possible for them, that when they get home, you can be reasonably sure or certain that they'll be done properly and that you give them a lot of repetition so it becomes easy and second nature and you're setting up habits and postures and flexibility and balance that you'll basically use forever. So now I'm gonna stop talking questions, have you any? Questions, anybody? Don't hesitate. Well, then maybe you've all very clear. Hi. Oh, yes. I do have one question. I am an older student, so I've been playing for like four years, and I just finally discovered that I had the completely wrong chair and the completely wrong posture. Um, so I've been really focused on that. That's why I signed in today. One of the problems I have is like when I'm playing, I'm, I'm now at a proper height and all of that, but I find as I go along, it's like my upper body is kind of collapsing over the cello or into the cello, and it actually affects the vibration and the sound. I can tell when I'm sitting up straight because the reverberation is much better. Yeah. Um, how do you teach young kids like how to sit properly, or, is, or do you have any exercises or suggestions that will keep me from having that inclination to lean into the instrument when it's not really what I want to be doing. First, in terms of with the little kids, I didn't really talk to people about sizes of cellos and sizes of chairs and stuff here today. Um, uh, it, it, it's stuff that can be talked about if you wanted to, but I, I just decided I was doing this other thing. Yeah. When I, what I want them to do is sit properly and then I want them to bring the cello back here. Okay. So we end up having, we end up having like a little checklist. Feet, uh, back, and cello. Now, I call this a shelf that the cello rests on. And this left leg, this left knee here is a shelf that the cello 
rests on, and then you do this, right? The idea being that if you've got your good tall posture, you've got your pillows uh, um, resting on the shelves, with your feet flat and everything, you're not having to hold it with your hands. So that's one of the things that a little setup exercise, like I said, in group class, I would make sure we have these routines before we play any piece. It's feet, back, fellow, bourbon, okay? Okay, good. Now, having said that, I will tell you that I have been reminding some of my students even this week not to look over the top of the cello. Right. We, all, we get a high, we get doing this. We're also visually oriented as humans that we go like this. And we have to consciously remind ourselves to be like this instead of like this. And I will tell you that it's not an uncommon thing that you're talking about right now. And yes, I try to set it up at the beginning, but it is an ongoing reminder once in a while. Okay, so I would just encourage you to think about your shelf first. And then as you play, keep your head up. Right. That's the secret, I think. You keep your head up. As soon as we look down, that's when shoulders come up and things get weird. So okay. Head up. Thank you. Sure. All right. Well, if everything was clear enough that there is no confusion and no more questions, then maybe we're done for today. We're looking forward for the next next session. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So it was really nice just before you all came. Uh, Scarlett and I set up this time in October, and we will have stuff to send to you in advance. I will send you PDFs of these one finger scale things that I do. And, and um, so, so what we, we will have another opportunity to have this kind of a session where I'm not just lecturing about my book, but we have a chance to experience for ourselves what the activities are like. Okay, okay. is this a question? I didn't see it. Um, no, I did not see a, a question in the chat yet. Fine. Um, I, I just wanted to say to um, diminish the amount of email, I'm going to send all people that subscribed to this evening or to this morning um, with a Zoom link for the next time. And you're not, um, you're free to attend or not, but it will diminish the amount of emails for everybody. And I will also join the PDF. So give me two weeks. Um, before I make the new Zoom link and this recording, I will join that on my YouTube channel and I will also send that in this email, okay? So you will have everything um, without mailing me or something. All right, so thank you again, Scarlett, for, for facilitating and making this happen. And thank you all for showing up. It's, uh, it, it, it's, it's really nice to, to, to do this thing. I mean, like I said, we, I'm just so much into let's, let's share and let's all learn from each other. And uh, it all gets better when we do that. Thank you. Thank you. you Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Everybody, Everybody, enjoy your day or your evening. See you next time. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Gracias. Bye, everybody.